thanks for staying with us. Time to talk about humanity. During the week, the 2022 uh, Humanitarian Response Plan for the Northeast of Nigeria was launched. And the aim, of course, um, is to improve living conditions and strengthen protection, uh, food security and nutrition, as well as livelihood opportunities for the people. So tell us more about this uh, response plan we have with us. Uh, sh uh, sh I, I, please pardon me if I murdered his name. Uh, sh Shmel or Shmale, please advise me, how do I pronounce your name? <laughs> Matthias Schmale, you are right. Schmale, I got it. Oh, yes. He is UN resident and humanitarian coordinator in Nigeria. Thanks for your time this morning. Well, uh, the, the question that Thank I want to... Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Oh, yes. The question that I want to ask you, first of all, is where are we about humanitarian response in the Northeast? So it is obviously worrying for all of us that we are now uh, in the 12th year uh, of this conflict uh, up there in the Northeast and uh, many years of a humanitarian response. And as things stand, it looks like things are not significantly improving. So uh, as you may know, we think there are 8.4 million people in need of humanitarian, uh, in, in humanitarian need. We will target uh, five and a half million people for our humanitarian assistance, and we are asking for $1.1 billion to do so. Of course, everyone hopes uh, that in the near future the situation will change and we will no longer be uh, in the situation of having to provide this uh, the humanitarian assistance. But for the moment, the situation requires us to continue these years of humanitarian work in the Northeast. Mm. 8.4 million people, uh, that's quite a number. And from information available from you, from your office, um, it cuts across uh, three states in particular, Borno, Adamawa and Yobe states, which are in dire need of this humanitarian response plan. So uh, talking about the plan that's uh, been launched, exactly what is this plan? Take, talk us through it. So it's, so it's basically continuity of assistance um, that I've referred to and key elements of it are really covering basic needs. So food, nutrition is one important component. Shelter is another one. Camp management, as you know, quite a few of the people are in camps. We, we estimate there are 2.2 million internally di displaced people across the three states you've mentioned. So managing camps uh, remains a key issue. And then where it's possible and situations are improving, we also try to give early recovery and livelihood support. That is critical, um, linked to what I was saying earlier. We hope the situation will improve and that people will eventually have opportunities for a more dignified life. So as we provide assistance that covers basic needs like food, like water, like shelter, we're also trying to expand and see where we can provide what we call livelihoods opportunities or support to, to livelihood work. And then finally, and a very important aspect of our humanitarian operation is protection work. You made a reference to that in your opening remarks. We know that 80% of the people in need are women and children, and they are often the ones most badly affected, including being exposed to violence, including gender-based violence. So protection work, which includes elements of advocacy with all duty bearers uh, to keep people safe is another compo important component. So it's humanitarian basic needs, it's early, livelihood, early recovery and livelihoods, and it's protection work. Food, shelter, clothing. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just abashed uh, looking at the issues that have, have been raised. And you stop, spoke about the fact that it's been 12 long years uh, that we've been dealing with this same thing. What are, from your findings, if any, what are some of the things that you think may be responsible for this slow pace 
of work, slow pace of re reversing the trend. So allow me to first of all underline that a humanitarian response can never solve the underlying issues. The underlying issues are not humanitarian in nature. The humanitarian needs I've described that we're trying to address um, are, are the symptoms of a deeper rooted um, issues. And of course the key one is the insurgency, uh, as it's called, um, by Boko Haram, the, the violence that is inflicted on the local population. And that needs to be addressed. Now, recent um, developments include a number of the people defecting, both people who've been fighting as well as their families. That's a hopeful sign. Um, it, it, there's an urgent need to, to, in a manner that deals with justice issues, reintegrate or make sure these people become a, a normal part of society again. So that's, that's an element of it. Overall, I think the, the solutions will require finding a way of dealing with the insurgency and ending it, but not just in military terms. I think there is also a requirement for political and socio-economic uh, solutions. If people are, and education, if people are educated, if they can work and earn their own money to buy food and cover their own needs, they will be less fertile ground for, for uh, violent and extremist groups to recruit them. Mm. How and how viable do you see that happening? The last bit you just talked about. How viable do you see that happening within the shortest possible time? Well, it's been interesting if you listen to the military that are an important actor up in the northeast. Um, they are confident that within the next year, before the election, they told me, uh, they will end it. Um, other people are more skeptical uh, and again I, I want to emphasize it from our experience as United Nations and the humanitarian community it cannot just be a military um, a solution we are very encouraged that the president recently instituted a commission uh, that is chaired by the vice president and the vice chair is governor Zulum from Bono State it, that will look at a more comprehensive across government approach to to, to resettlement, reintegration, and that will of course uh, require also urgently looking at finding political ways forward to solve this. It's hard to give you a clear time frame at the end of the day. It depends on the government, the military, and of course hopefully at some point a reason returning to those uh, yeah. conducting the insurgency. Well, you talked about a $1.1 billion bill to fund this HRP. Uh, what are your expectations? What are the expectations of your office uh, concerning the source of uh, funding the HRP? So the first thing to be said is that remarkably over the last couple of years, last four or five years, the international community has been quite generous. So last year in 2021, uh, the, the appeal, we launched the humanitarian response plan, as we call it, was almost 70% covered. So that's almost $700 million. If you look at other crises around the world, whether it's Yemen, Syria, you know them all, this is not bad, actually, uh, for Nigeria and our, uh, for the Northeast in Nigeria. So we are hoping uh, that the international community will continue to be as generous as they have been um, uh, and, and and maintain at least these funding levels that we've seen and hopefully of course uh, give us a uh, hundred percent but the honest truth is competition as it were because of the many uh, global crises around the world is tough and this is one reason why we recently had the visit of the emergency relief coordinator the under secretary general martin griffith from new york uh, to make sure that uh, the northeast uh, the humanitarian crisis in the northeast it gets the attention also from the donor community that it deserves. Mm. Leave no one behind. It's one of the uh, catchphrases that the United Nations has been running on, especially given the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, 
clearly it's not just going to be something that only the United Nations has to be a part of. The governments of, uh, of Nigeria also have their roles to play. Um, the state governors or state governments themselves and the federal government. What are the expectations of your office from these governments? So the first thing to underline is we are here at invitation of the government. You know, we don't just run in um, and do our work. The, the government, both at federal and then at state level, invited us a few years ago to assist. Uh, so that's the first point. The second point linked to that is around the world it's uh, accepted that governments carry the main responsibility to look after the well-being and welfare of their citizens. So uh, as I uh, reflected in earlier comments, of course the government has to be in the lead not only in, in defining what humanitarian work should be done but also in looking at solving the underlying problems and creating a more conducive and environment for dignified lives. So that's the way we see it in the United Nations. It's the governments um, that are in charge and we have a very respectful relationship with the federal and state governments in Nigeria. They need to lead and define where we can come in in a complementary way. Having said that, of course, the, Nigeria has been a respected member state of the United Nations, if I remember correctly, since 1960 and uh, has signed up to a number of conventions international protocols, values, and part of our role also is to remind each other of how we should conduct our business, including government business. I'm mentioning that because an important point in the Northeast, especially for the internally displaced communities, but also the host communities, is that their voices are heard. We must make sure on the government side and on the side of the international community that people are always at the center of what we do, that their voices heard and that they are given choices as to what dignified life could look like. People, Mr. Shmali, people. At the end of the day, it's about people. The uh, issues being raised came from the people. Um, the solutions will also come from the people. So in terms of people, What's their role in all these? The people who are suffering, the people who are perpetuating, the traditional rulers, uh, the traditional leaders, the community leaders, and the people themselves at the lower rung of the ladder. Is there any role they can play in helping to resolve this issue on the long term? Yes, for sure. I, I think it starts and ends with people. My colleagues in the UN know that I like to say that the Charter of the United Nations doesn't start with we the government. It starts with we the people. So for the UN and its member states, including Nigeria, it's ultimately all we, we do is about the well-being, the welfare, the dignity of the people we are mandated to serve. And that means we must find ways, you know, and some of that is going on, but there's a, a much to improve, of making sure that their voice is heard, both in terms of analysis. So the analysis that underlines our humanitarian response plan is very much influenced by what we heard from the people affected, including internally displaced as well as host communities. But then also as things evolve, um, we need to invo continue involving them uh, so that they can help shape what appropriate actions are. So I have been privileged to visit twice the Northeast Bono State. I've listened and had some discussions with affected people. And it's very clear if they had a choice, they would want to go home to their places of origin or properly integrate into urban centers. And so we need to take that serious. We need to listen to when they say we can only do so, either return or integrate if the the situation is safe and please work with us uh, to define what safety means, what basic services we need. So it's an evolving, continuous process. It's not a one-off, let's ask them for their opinion. Uh, the affected people must be at the center from the phase of assessment through implementation, through monitoring and evaluation, and then refining and adjusting whatever we do. You mentioned earlier that uh, Nigeria, as several other countries, 
is a signatory to many of the conventions of the United Nations. One of those conventions concerns the rights of the child uh, and, and all of that. You also underscored the fact that a good number of the people that we are talking about here, uh, four point, beg your pardon, 8.4 million people, a good number of them are children. In terms of uh, domesticating the charters, the United Nations charters concerning children, how well would you say we have fared as a nation and uh, what areas do you assess that we need improvement and that the people can be a part of? If I hear your correct your question correctly, this is not just the Northeast, this is a broader question. But let me say uh, two, three things. One is what is critical is education. You know, my, my colleague Mohamed Yahya, who heads the UNDP work here in Nigeria, said recently in, in a public discussion, it's, there's evidence that children whose access to education is blocked become fertile ground for extremist and violence thinking. So providing solid, decent education is critical. I was also recently at a launch event for a Children at Risk initiative of the government and it's it's a staggering number of more than 10 million children who are out of school including many girls so i think we cannot jointly un under emphasize or over emphasize rather the importance of quality education and my understanding is i've only been in nigeria a bit more than two months that there are challenges there <clears throat> to maintain quality of education a second bit is then looking at the basic rights of children beyond education and food and nutrition is an important element. Um, for the Northeast, to make it more specific again for that, we are worried that this year we could, in 2022, we could again see 1.4 million children under five facing severe uh, malnutrition and hunger. So that's something we need to look out for, you know, a child that goes through uh, severe deprivation deprivation of food is marked for life. And that brings me to my third and final point, again limited to the Northeast, but we know there's violence elsewhere. Children who experience violence are often traumatized. Uh, you know, it's struck me that uh, I mentioned the, the number of years, 12 years. So children who are 12 years and younger in the Northeast or many parts of the Northeast have not experienced a peaceful environment. And that will inf affect their psychological well-being. So it, it is about basic education, it is about meeting basic needs, notably food, but it's also looking at their psychological well-being and providing them mental health support. And what are the consequences, the risks for the future if we do not do the needful now, Mr. Schmale? Well, my, uh, again, my understanding is that um, a, a large percentage of Nigeria's vast population is our young people below the age of 30. And uh, so I think what is at risk if the, the young generation is not brought into the fold, both in terms of education, having their basic needs met, and then, of course, employment opportunities uh, or livelihoods opportunities. What's the point of education? I've often been asked, not just in Nigeria, from children. Um, if I then become unemployed, join the million people getting unemployed each year. Uh, so it, it, it's very clear in my mind, and I'm not telling you anything that I've invented, that if you are not able as a country to look after the well-being of your young and provide them opportunities for a dignified life and that includes uh, very much employment uh, opportunities you risk the stability of the entire nation so there's a lot at stake if the focus doesn't uh, remain or get intensified on the young and how to engage them meaningfully into the future I know you don't want to talk about this, but I'm going to ask you anyway, Mr. Schmale. How, how political are some of the issues that you have raised? Well, the, the question is 
what is political and what is non-political. If you talk about the affairs of the state, you can very easily be accused of, of becoming too political. Now, our approach, and especially when we talk about humanitarian work, which is the context of our conversation, is that we must maintain neutrality, that we don't take positions in terms of political parties um, or what governments do in public, at least. You know, we, as I said earlier, are here to support government. So our starting point will always be uh, to, to respect the sovereignty of, of governments and to be led by their analysis and their plans and their intended services. As I think I also indicated earlier, that doesn't mean that we won't, behind closed doors, in the case of the United Nations, have debates uh, and uh, raise with government if we think some things are going wrong. You mentioned earlier, if I remember correctly, the Convention of the Child, protection the rights of children. So, of course, if we see that being violated, we will raise that, and some people will say, there you're becoming political. My sense is, as long as we always remain respectful of the sovereignty of the Nigerian state at federal and, and um, state level, and if we raise issues that we think are not going so well in a, in a, in a respect respectful and constructive manner, we cannot be involved, in, accused of, of getting into politics in the wrong manner. Well, we just have to thank you very much for everything that you have been doing and we can wish you the best. Mathias Shmale, United Nations Resident and Humanitarian Coordinator in Nigeria. Thank you so much for the enlightenment you've given us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay.